you so much. I always, when I do these shows in LA, I always feel like the ghost of Christmas future for all of you. Oh, that's not funny. I, I, I thought it'd be funny because I might be the oldest person here who's married and has kids, but maybe there's some of you here. That's so exciting. Okay, so here's my story. Um, uh, this is a story I call Fool in Love, and I might have to refer to notes because I'm that old. Um, so my son, uh, Gideon David Modisette was born uh, July s Oh my God. <laughs> I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast. Uh, July 20th, 2007, and um, he has white blonde hair and gangly arms, and I say, oh, look at my Paul Bettany love child. <laughs> and thank you, sir, because the nurse did not think that was funny. <laughs> because she didn't get it. But the cry it was so piercing, and it was so lovely, and if the two previous years that I felt like I was in a terrible dream, and it felt like a nightmare, because it was so hard to get pregnant with him, they were, it was clearly not a dream. I was joyfully awake and I had this beautiful baby and it was so exciting. Oh my God. Wow, applause break. That means a lot, it's so exciting. So uh, because my, my, I do have an older child and it was an emergency uh, C-section and the whole thing and his heart kept failing and uh, people would come in the room and then they would disappear and I finally turned to the nurse and I said, okay, well if this were 100 years ago, what would happen? And she said, one of you would die. And I said, okay, cut me open, let's do it. So I had that emergency C-section and then this was a scheduled C-section. Does everyone know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Now I feel like I'm, t I'm teaching a class in labor and delivery. Um, so that's when they cut, you know, they do it here instead of here. And, uh, and uh, anyway, it was a very standard birth. They put the baby on my chest, no drama. Even though I love drama, I was like, okay, this is, I was told that it was better for the baby because I was so old. And I also joke that I had um, capped my cervix for so long trying not to get pregnant. That, like when I finally wanted it to open for good reason, it was not gonna happen. So, so I was like, okay, uh, we'll do the right thing, we'll have the C-section. So fine, so cut to, we're in the room and I'm looking at my baby and I'm so, like even though when you do, I did IVF, I'm using a lot of acronyms tonight. Uh, IVF, anyone? Okay, so if you don't know, ask the older, oldest person you know in LA who has a child. Uh, <laughs> in any event, so uh, you, when you do that, you do kind of feel, I do, I'll just say I do, feel like you're kind of, I was forcing the hand of God a little bit with the extra baby. And, but then he, there he was and everything was fine. So I was fine, it was safe, it was great. And my friend was sitting at the end of the bed, my friend for 15 years who was with me when I threw dirt on my father's grave. So it was so beautiful to be there for new life. And she looks down and she says, that is the most chill baby. And I was like, oh yeah, I know. That's, that's the kind of kids I make, what can I tell you? <laughs> and, uh, and then within like a minute, a nurse came in, comes in, she takes my temperature, she looks at the bassinet and does like a false exit and comes back in and wheels the, starts to wheel the baby out. And I'm like, what, what do you, what, what, what? And she said, oh, well, you know, the color is a little off, but it's probably just the lighting in here. I'm gonna take him out into the hallway and look at him. And, uh, and then she, proceeds to take the baby down the hall, like goodbye with the baby, and, uh, and I turn to my husband, who of course is there with his father talking about the American Civil War. <laughs> because that's what you talk about when there's a new baby. <laughs> and, uh, and then my mother's there, and she has only this to say, I can't eat the top of this because a muffin is really just cake. <laughs> And that's pretty much what's going on in the room while my baby is going down the hall. And I say, Todd, Todd. And he, so he uh, goes up and then my friend Catherine says, I'll, do you want me to check? I'll just check for you. And I say, yes, please, somebody check. Cause it's all falling in on me now suddenly. And uh, she comes back 10 minutes and what feels like a half an hour later and she says, oh, it's fine y'all. And suddenly she's talking in that very nervous Southern accent. So I know it's not fine. She's like, oh, it's fine y'all. The baby just needs more oxygen. That's all, just needs a little more oxygen. They're gonna give it more oxygen. And I'm like, oh, I, I can't even believe this is happening. And so 
Then they have one of these mirrors in the room where you can see down all the different hallways. So then I start to see this gang of three. It's my husband, his friend, and now a man in scrubs who I've never seen before. And this man walks in, he pushes the glasses up off his nose and he puts a leg on the bed and he leans back. Now picture, if you will, that Dos Equis most interesting man, <laughs> if he were a doctor. Yeah. And he's like, well, it seems that there's a problem with your baby. And he has this, he's Norwegian or Swedish, but all I hear is German. <laughs> and I don't like him. And I hate to be pro-Semitic, but do you think you could have found me a Jewish doctor <laughs> instead of Mr. fucking Norwegian dude? But fine. And he's like, well, there's a problem with the lungs. And we don't know. It could be a hole in the heart. Or it could be, it could be spinal meningitis. Of course, we don't know. We have to run the test. We don't know. It could be a punctured lung. And, and then I just see my husband stand up like a red-headed geyser and le leap across the bed and say, if you don't fucking know, then go run your fucking tests. <laughs> and now, my husband will tell you that he didn't say fuck, but that's what I heard. <laughs> and so then, the doctor, who is tone deaf to humanity, continues on, well, I want her to know the worst case scenario. <laughs> in case there's a problem in the neonatal intensive care unit where we're taking the baby, I want her to know what it could, she could die. And then my father-in-law and my husband, using all military prowess, stand up and physically remove the man from the room. I know, right? Yay. Applause breaks for them. And then my head just sinks, and I just can't believe that this is what I have done with my life, that I have so clearly fucked this up, everything. I've ruined everything with this. And then they take the baby to the NICU, and I like kind of, you know, I had a C, I was a mess, and I'm like, but I like position myself out of the bed, I get in the wheelchair, I go up, and I see this kind of uh, animatronic child, or whatever that word is, that you people probably know because you're younger and know what that means. But I mean not a real baby. It's like a thing hooked up to wires and gauze on its yeah. feet, and they let you put two fingers in latex in to, to, to look at the most impossibly small stomach I've ever seen until I turn to my right and see a baby that's two pounds and two ounces, and then I see my baby who suddenly looks like Paul Bunyan at seven, <laughs> seven pounds and I know that even this is awful, it's not that, so I can even have gratitude in this moment. And then the nurse says, well, the test came back and everything except the blood test is positive, he's fine, negative, whatever the thing that's supposed to be good. <laughs> the baby's not gonna die. The baby did not die. But then I see Dr. Vanderdoom, as I've come to know him. And of course, he, he's got a, I say, hey, from my wheelchair, hey, looks like the baby's going to be OK. <laughs> Just some blood tests. Otherwise, the baby's great. And he pulls up a chair. Well, we don't know if the baby, sometimes it happens later. He'll have to be And then my husband just takes me and wheels me away. And then we get the blood test, uh, and he passes all the blood tests, and everything is, it's, it's, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. He has to stay in, that, in the ward, but he's off the machines, and he's OK. And I think, OK, well, I didn't fuck everything up, and I'm, gonna have a, I'm not going to ruin my older boy's life, and we're going to be a family, and it's going to be OK. And uh, the, I guess the end of the story really is that I, they let me leave, they never let you leave NICU. Don't ever get anything in the NICU because they don't let you leave. It's like policy. You're all like, oh shit, I'm never having a baby. <laughs> I'm never having a baby, just like she said. Don't do it. Um, but I wheeled myself out. As we were wheeling out and I was going to the ward, uh, the, the, all the tests came, had come back. I already said that. And I passed Dr. Vanderdoom and I'm like, yeah, the baby going to live, Dr. Vanderdoom. Take that. That's the end of the story. Bye. Danny Klein, Monaset. <laughs>